Kevin Sexton here with Sexton Creations. We're here at the headquarters, Santiago Cerrillo here. Uh, this is our Indiegogo project. Uh, we were trying to raise money to finish our new director cuts of uh, episodes one, two, three, and four. Uh, you're starring in the uh, Legend of the Black Cross and the Soul of the Angel Fire. And ladies and gentlemen, we need this money to really uh, to get the locations that we need and some new equipment so we can get the top-notch product out. Santiago, tell the viewers out here, what does this project mean to you? Oh man, it means a lot to me. I, I love hanging out here in Dalton, Georgia and doing great projects with Sex and Creations. This is the independent world. This is what the world needs right now. All these uh, independent projects need to be funded and help so we can secure better entertainment for our, for our families, our friends, and to uh, and boost out the, the talent that is that is not known, that is not being seen. You know, we got a lot of directors, producers, actors, everybody who needs that that's somewhat of a spotlight to know that, hey, we got some great projects going on. And Paranormal Chasers and Sex and Creations, I mean, it's, it's something that you need to fund, need to help. All righty, thank you very much, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to the Indie Lounge, uh, where we interview some independent artists, filmmakers of all types of talents. And uh, today we have a special guest, uh, Mr. Kev Ken uh, Kevin Sexton from Sexton Creations. Uh, I want to introduce you to him because he's been working on some projects, uh, a lot of independent films. And what I like about him is that he really incorporates a lot of different talents in the artistic realm from uh, painting and, and illustrating to sculpting and, of course, now filmmaking. So welcome, Mr. Sexton. Hey, how y'all doing today? We are doing great. Um, it's awesome that you have come. I appreciate you coming to the show. And what I would like to kind of get off the ground is to give our audience a little bit of knowledge about your background and who you are. Uh, well, I got into the independent film business uh, about 10 years ago, and that came about. I had been a, at 11 years as a pro wrestler at that time. Uh, wrestled for National Wrestling Federation, uh, Smoky Mountain Championship Wrestling, and several other from Kentucky all the way down to Florida. So uh, after 11 years, I had to run into a couple of movie producers and uh, a guy from uh, the Jerry Springer show was trying to get me on that show and hire me to do some fight scenes and stuff. So that's how I kind of started making the connections and run into a, a movie producer by the name of Mark Hanna. And then he started to, uh, was trying to get, he was hiring me to hire other pro wrestlers to do uh, action scenes like in their chase scenes, bank robberies and stuff like that. Cause you know, we're used to beating the fool out of each other and stuff like that. You know, we, <laughs> we're really good at it. So, so he said, you know, that's the best kind of, you know, cause the actors were horrible at fight scenes. So, and he went to several of the wrestling shows with me and we picked some guys and stuff. And from there it went on to uh, next thing you know, we're, I'm at his house till two o'clock one morning and we're talking about vampire movies. So, and then the next thing you know, I'm writing a, uh, a uh, vampire movie script, which then three months later, he twists his arm to create my own comic book series called Vampires Dalton Knights. And fast forward 10 years later, now the uh, comic book series has turned into my new uh, movie that I'm working on called Paranormal Chasers. So it, it's this is about the third different name that I've changed it into. And because uh, it's just, you know, over the years, I try to throw it away and then. Next thing you know, I'm getting phone calls and emails. People want to see another new video or the new version. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you just go back to the drawing board and, you know, you, you listen to your fans. You know, they tell you what they like and what they don't like. And and I just would make a list and, and some things I would take in consideration and some things, you know, you know, this is the story. This is what I like. This is, you know, you know, sometimes as a director and creator of your own story, you know, it, you got to listen to the viewers, but at the same time, you got to go of your gut. And if you something needs to be in the story, you got to keep it in there. And then other things are, you know, are always up for grabs. You know, if it's if it's there, it's there. If it's not, no big deal. So, but this is like the the third version, like I said, uh, of my whole vampire uh, saga that I've been working on for the last ten years. And and for whatever reason, I, I think I finally, you know, I'm on the right track because now. Everything that we're doing, every story that we're doing, people are loving 95% of it instead of only <laughs> loving 50% of it. So, you know, cool. and it's just the, the story has, it's it's taken on a life of its own. And, and now it, it's it's in front of me and I'm having a blast. And I, and I got a new partner, uh, Meryl Thomason, 
with uh, Artistic International Studios. We partnered up uh, of October of 2013, so a, about a year and a half ago. And since we got together, we have just been full steam ahead. We got uh, we got our first film called The India Mummy. Got it over with last year uh, around the springtime. Then early summer, we came out with our second installment called The Ghostly Guest. And then from there, that's when I met uh, Santiago Cirillo from The Walking Dead. And he's like begging me, begging me, dude, I want to be a, on one of your movies. I said, well, I got this going on right now. He said, dude, I want to be in it right now. If you don't get me right now, next year I'm going to be too busy to get me. So. <laughs> say this the, the enthusiasm is there and the storytelling and his ability which is amazing <laughs> to, to get other people on board right. I mean that's to inspire them. that's not a talent that's a gift right, I mean, right. he has that so my well, that, and that's, a, that's the highest compliment to me that's the highest compliment we can give a fellow filmmaker to turn the baby over to somebody well, 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 no, just, just, just that, that this yeah. this is you yeah. and I see yeah. you on every crazy man there's so many in Hollywood, so many anonymous films that are made that, that any, you know, a hundred people could have made them. But only one person or two people, one couple could have made Paranormal Chasers, and that's, that's Kevin and Ken. Yeah. I said, all right, I'll scratch these three projects that I was getting ready to get started on. I said, okay, now if you're going to do this, I'm, I said, I, then I'm going to work you to death between now and then, you know, then you can go do your own thing. I said, but between these little a uh, six month window that you said I have here, I said, if we're going to do this, let's get all that we can get. So we decided to do uh, two, about, they're going to be almost a, a 90 minute film, but they're going to be over an hour at least, almost 90 minutes in. So we was able to make two projects out of it instead of just doing one. Nice. So, and it's called the uh, Legends of the Black Cross. And the fourth installment is going to be called The Soul of the Angel Fire. And what these two movies are going to represent is going to take the story of the comic book that i started 10 years ago and i'm wrapping up the storylines because i done 13 comic books and i started up a whole bunch of story arcs and everything and so these two movies will end the story arcs will wrap everything up that way when i start with number five it's all fresh material a whole new world i get to start off with and that to me is very exciting because i've been doing the same characters and the same storylines for nearly 11 years now. And I'm ready to do something new. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> well, now, before, before we go too deep into that, uh, let us start. Um, <coughs> let's start with, let's say your background. Yes. Now, um, at some point you've decided to, to get into some kind of art. Now, what, what, what started it off? Was it film? Was it comics? What, uh, it actually all started uh, back when I was three years old. My mom started teaching me uh, this basic drawing and actually oil painting. I done my first oil painting of flowers and vases at three years old. So, and uh, then the next thing you know, I made the front page of the newspaper. I actually drew an Indian out of a book onto my leg upside down. But on my leg, it was correct. 
years. <laughs> okay. So the next thing you know, I'm on the front page newspaper. I'm four years old when I done this, and it, the Indian looked just like it did in the book. So, and I done it with an ink pen. So no erasing, bam, just knocked it out. So, so from then, the, and mom just started pushing me like crazy. Any kind of oil painting class, watercolor class, you know. So, so was mom an artist also? Well, she started about a year and a half before I did. Uh, I was one when she started taking classes. Then she started teaching me when I was right at three years old. So my mother's only been doing it technically two years before me but you know at three i mean she said i was learning things but you know heck i was three i can't i can't tell you what i did back then so okay. but but no it just from there i, I was always uh, around her uh doing all these different art classes at ymcas and stuff like that so then next thing you know i'm always making things designing things give me duct tape and cardboard and i would give you a sculpture so so and then uh and then the next thing I know, about almost five years ago, uh, a buddy of mine that I told you about, Robert Brown, who done, who's kind of been my teacher in the in the two D art and stuff like that, and, uh, and stuff. He uh, was talking about he was wanting, he done the a comic book called Bane of the Werewolf, and he was always wanted that uh, his character, the werewolf to be like a statue or an action figure and everything. And I thought, you know, okay. that's something I've always wanted to get into because I, I, I love toys. I'm a Star Wars toy freak ever since the first movie and forever will be. And so one weekend I, I, I read an article about it on how to do it. It's a Claver Moore who done Lady Death figures. Mm -hmm. uh, he was my inspiration on the sculpting. And uh, Frank Frazetta was really the, my idol for his oil painting went and but anyway I, he had a little seven page article i think in a toy fair magazine so i read how to do it in that little seven page article and went and got all the stuff and i went from a friday night to a sunday afternoon i think i spent 24 hours on this 10 inch tall werewolf and done it and i actually looked at it, i thought you know i kind of like it you know you know it was my first one you know I, I didn't didn't really know what i was doing but i took it over to his house and I said, dude, I got something for you. And I go, he goes, all right, put it on the coffee table. So I opened up the box, set him down. He comes around the corner and the dude about had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. He starts yelling, screaming, cussing, runs outside, yells for his neighbors to come over. And I'm like, you know, I thought the guy was, you know, this, he just like lost his brain, you know? And then he said, dude, quit drawing, quit painting. From now on, you're a professional sculptor. And so, so he just, he just loved it, and he's been my number one guy who keeps pushing me to sculpt, sculpt, sculpt. That's so, cool. so and, now, uh, so you you you've kind of so you go from drawing and, and painting, and you go into sculpting, cold turkey. It sounds like yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, and now, where did the wrestling come in? Uh, wrestling, uh, actually, about the same time, three years old. Uh, that was a, an amazing time in my life. I had an uncle Bobby uh small stature guy he only about five seven but he was like 230 pounds of sheer mm. working a steel mill muscle i mean and the, and every saturday afternoon uh, well every saturday evening the nwa championship wrestling would come on and this is about 1975 mm -hmm. so harley race and rick flair carry varn erica on the tv so we'd sit there and watch it and i was a very adhd kind of kid i was very hyper it's hard to calm me down. So then he would spend the next hour or two just beating the hell out of me. I mean, he would tie me up in these wrestling knots and put the forearm in my face. And, you know, you know, he'd come where I was raised. We come from very rough guys. I mean, my dad was six, six. He looked, he was Clint Eastwood, man. I mean, the guy didn't say much, but when he did, you, you listen. I mean, he was just a massive man. And these guys grew up in a, in a time where, uh, it would have been called child abuse the way they got spanked. <laughs> so, I mean, these, you know, I mean, they grew up out in the country where they they had their own rules and how they, you know, it's just a rougher time than what it is nowadays. And But I think that was the greatest thing that ever could happen to me because I learned at a young age to, to take a licking and keep on ticking, so to speak. So, and, it, and it's probably been the the best valuable thing on whether it's art or pro wrestling is 
is if you want something bad enough and it's in your heart and you got the desire to do it, all you got to do is make up your mind to get off your butt and make it happen. Hmm. So anything worth getting, it, it's worth the hard work to get to it. So, so now, uh, so you get into, I guess, doing stunts. Yes. Um, yes. At what point did you, like, how did you suddenly say, I'm going to do my own films? Like, is it, uh, you, you mentioned you, you started writing your own comic books. Now, right. where, where did comic books and then film come crisscross? Well, when I first got into the film industry, I was just doing the uh, stunt and, uh, and choreography on the action scenes. And that's when I first got into that. And uh, and like I said, and I, and I got to know these producers and directors and stuff. And they really loved my storytelling idea the way I was doing it physically with the, the acting. And with a fight uh, choreography. And then we was just, they started inviting me to these meetings and stuff. And they was really liking my ideas. So I, he, uh, Mark Cannon invited me over his house. Uh, I met him like 10 o'clock one night. We went over to his office and we started talking about, you know, hey, I've always wanted to do a vampire movie. Because at the time, I was, a, I loved Buffy, the Angel TV series and all that. But, you know, of course, I want to do my own thing. So I, he said, well, won't you start writing a script? And every couple of weeks, come over and we'll have dinner and I'll see how you're going. So he was, in a sense, teaching me how to write movie scripts, but I, he was letting me write my own story. And he was, you know, it's like a training thing. So when I come over to the first meeting we had after that, I had these drawings of my character because that's when I'm writing things, I draw. And, you know, if I have a vision of a character or a place, I start doing sketches, and he really loved my sketches for whatever reason. He's like, "Man, these are cool! Ooh, this vampire's getting his head chopped off, you know, and all this, uh, you know, vampires getting set on fire and everything." He said, "Man, you just need to do your own comic book." And I was like, "Dude, I don't know how to do a comic book. You're crazy. It takes seven people to do a comic book." And uh, so, about three months of him every time we're meeting every two or three weeks, and he's this man. You got to do a comic book. You got to do a comic book. He's Finally, I just done it to shut the man up, and uh, so I just done it. You know, he was my teacher, so to speak, and and this guy was very passionate about me doing this, mm -hmm. and and I didn't understand it then, but I'm grateful that I listened to my teacher back ten years ago because I creating this comic book series. Like I said, I done thirteen uh, books totally on my own, wrote it, edited it, drew it, everything, distributed. It. And it was the best thing I ever did because it opened up this window of people getting. I had people from Australia buying my comic books, uh, Canada, California, Florida. I sold them everywhere but actually Dalton. I actually sold less than Dalton than I did everywhere else, and that's where the comic book was based out of. So that's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's funny. So now how did you? Well, kind of let's get a little background of how you created the comic. So yeah. okay, writing I get, and even yeah. the artwork I get. Yeah, but now putting it together, where did you go to learn, or like, what did you do? What did you do to research this? Uh, the, the just the research. Uh, what I was actually doing was this. Uh, I had a huge thing about as a child, urban legends, Bigfoot, Loch Ness monster, you know, the Jersey Devil, the Chupacabra, all these little stories. My mom even had books on the unexplained mysteries and stuff like that. And this growing up, I always had. I was a huge fan of these things. And anytime they come on TV, I was in front of that TV, you know, because I love any of those, you know, genres of storytelling. So, you know, I thought, you know, what would be awesome if I could write my own series where not only are these guys, they do, you know, the basic vampires and demons, they're hunt chupacabras, go chase down a Bigfoot. You know, every weekend, it's a new bad guy, a new legend, a witch, you know, anything like that. You know, I just want to, it was kind of like, I wanted to create this series to be like, uh, X Files and Ghost Hunters, you know, Fringe, anything that can pop and be in your imagination, it could be these guys' story. So, mm. from demons to ghosts, it, it, it didn't matter, you know. You know, anything that's, you know, I, I wanted, I want my viewers to not know what in the hell is going to happen next week. <laughs> so, that, that's, that's my thing, you know. It could be aliens next week for all we know, so now all right so let's let's give the um 
your books a little bit more depth. Okay. For, especially for those who, who may not have, not have seen the comic book or, right. or don't know where to get one. Uh, give us an idea of the, who the characters are and what the stories are like. I mean, uh, the the basic, the, the start so. off, uh, Jonathan Crosley, uh, he was uh, this, he's a watch, he's a hunter. He goes around hunting demons, ghosts. He's the head research guy. And he had an adopted son and daughter that he rescued from an orphanage that was being attacked by vampires. And for whatever reason, he decided to keep these two young kids because out of all the kids that were running or not getting killed, these two were actually trying to fight the vampires. They were picking up things, throwing at they had They showed no fear. So he decided that these kids have this natural ability about them to stand their ground at, at the age of, I think it's six and four years old, the kids were. So he ends up, when he rescued them, because the, the lady who was running it got killed, so he just takes them and keeps them for himself. And he raises them up in this world to teach them how to hunt werewolves and vampires and teaches them about ghosts and spirits and angels and demons. And, and then next thing you know, so from the time they're six and four, he raises them all over the, they go to Europe, all over the North America and South America. They just travel all over the world until they get this case about vampires or a possible large vampire coven happening in Dalton, Georgia. And when they get here in Dalton, it's that it being a little bitty uh, nest of goons, it turns out to be this massive underworld of vampires that were, like I said, we this is the carpet capital of the world. So the third shift of the Hispanics working in the carpet mills is just like 50,000 people in this area. So it's just insane. So my story was that the vampires migrated from New Mexico to work the third shift to blend in with everybody to be normal. But during the daytime, the vampires sleep, you know, in their little hideouts. But at night, they work like everybody, everyone else. They blend in on the third shift because no one else wants to work it. So that was the, the basics of the story on how such a large vampire infestation happened because they're just trying to be normal. So you're saying that Latinos are vampires? Yes, that's that's how it all <laughs> got started. So it's kind of like Robert so Rodriguez. Not racist. I got I got tons of Hispanic fans, and actually they they love that I done it because actually the his the vampire lore is huge in Mexico. Mm. So it's all about the undead down there and, and everything. So no, they they love they thought it was a great idea. So. Okay, very cool. So yeah. now, um, what what kind of gave you the idea? Like, did you just suddenly write it, or was there some kind of inspiration behind it? Well, I, I worked in the carpet mill, so I got the you know I used to work. I used to be that third shift guy, you know, feel like a zombie every night when you're going to work. And I thought, you know, and people used to make jokes about uh, only zombies work at the carpet mills and vampires. You know, it, it came to be a, a bad joke that I thought, you know, this would make a cool story. So I. I was taking all these stupid, j stupid third shift jokes, and I thought, you know, I just my mind's like a tape recorder, man. If I if I see it, smell it, it's in there forever. So, so simply just, put, you're like, I'll show you. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I, and actually, I just started coming up with these little ideas, and I would bring them to work. I'd like write a little scene, and and everybody's like, oh man, that that's pretty cool, and like these little short stories, mm -hmm. little one page story about how. A girl uh, is is on third shift working, and she goes on break. That steps outside, gets a smoke, and she gets attacked by a vampire. Just mm -hmm. stupid little things like that. And uh, and uh, if I don't, I don't know if you see have them in your town, like the like a subway. They have the guys or little Caesars. They have the mascot out on the side of the road, hang you know dancing with the sign right. or whatever. Or one of them they had we had used to have this one. It looks like a drink cup. And so we had a guy out there on third shift dancing around on the side of the road as a drink cup. Well, he got attacked by vampires. He got drunk. Mm -hmm. So I'd I done little stories like that, and everybody just thought they were cool, they were gory, and they was hilarious. So they just mm -hmm. everybody thought it was funny. So it went from short stories, and the next thing I know, when I got it with Mark Hanna and in the independent film, he said, man, I've always wanted to do a vampire. And I thought, man, I got all these crazy little notes of stories, and then I just... You know, and I, I just finally, I just took all these crazy ideas and I thought, oh, now, which is the one that everybody reacted the most to? 
And that's where I kind of got my essence. So, so, so these stories are basically what's turning into these films. Is that right? Yeah, all these little crazy ideas. And then, like I said, when I started creating the the, the leader and then later on, I, I come up with the kids because I, I needed the children came from I, I was as a, as a father at that time. I had two small kids and I and I had these two crazy small kids. I mean, these kids were very odd, very unique. And the little boy was like three years old. And cartwheeled everywhere he went. He never would walk normal. He cartwheeled and backflipped everywhere. And the little girl was this, she was always super quiet and major intelligent and read, could figure anything out like computers and VCR. She just, you just, she just looked, oh, that's how it works. She didn't have to show her nothing. And, and I thought, you know, the Jonathan Crowsley, he needs two kids to help keep him human because he was out here killing demons and ghosts he it was making him hard-hearted so these two kids kept his softer side his human side kept him in the now reality versus the the world they lived in it was too easy to go become the what you were hunting you know it messed with him mentally so so you've done how many films already uh we're like now we're on the third and fourth film right now we're doing both of them at the same time so, and how, like, how are you budgeting this? Like, where are you getting the the funds to do this? Or is this a lot we got of a couple of small investors helping out some local businesses and everything. But actually, I saved money before all this happened. I'm funding every bit of it myself. So, when you're the guy who creates the costumes, builds the sets, and I'm I'm the principal artist, design everything. So. About a year before we started doing all this, I spent about a year and a half just building things and designing things. And but I actually got it. We got it designed now to where the, the headquarters has like a little living room, kind of like on the uh, Firefly TV show. I don't know if, uh, if yeah. any Firefly fans out there, uh, you know how the Firefly had the common area where everybody just kind of lounged around and hung out. So the teams kind of got. The, I wanted the. My focus right now is sh having this team of misfits that have been thrown together to they're becoming a family. And that's the key to any kind of TV show or video series you want to do. It's all about the family dynamic, whether they're blood related or not. If you want to sell a story, it's all about that family dynamic. You get your viewers to care about these people. It's not about the monster of the week or the monster of the day. Mm -hmm. It's about how that craziness affects this family. Now, tell us a little bit on you're working on these two films simultaneously and you mentioned Santiago. Yes. So uh, give us a little bit of background on that. A little over a year ago, I think it was last summer, uh, up in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, me and Santiago both were celebrities at a show. He was doing the Walking Dead stuff, and I was doing my paranormal stuff and my all my artwork. And I was actually over there goofing around making something, not really paying attention to anybody. And uh, he come walking by, checking out my artwork and everything, and he just fell in love with my statues. And he just, man, where'd you get this stuff at? And I said, well, I made it. And he's like, are you kidding me? You know, he just, he's very hyper guy, man. He's like, you know, hundred miles an hour energy. And he just fell in love with my statues. And he actually bought a couple small pieces and I actually had a sketchbook. He loved the artwork and that. And then he gets down to the end of the table. He said, paranormal chasers. What the heck? He, you got a movie? He, he you do movies? And I was like, yeah, man, I do. I got my own video series that we're working on. And that's the number one movie. And I said, Next month, we'll be uh, wrapping up number two, and we'll be done with it. And i am actually got ideas for number three, four, and five in the works and everything. Mm -hmm. And he said, man, i got to have this. So he buys my first movie right off the bat, and he uh, we shot the bull the rest of the weekend. And the next thing I know, I think about Tuesday, a couple of days later, he's called me up. I'm upstairs working out on the punching bag. Phone rings, and it's him. And uh he said, dude, I just got done watching your movie four times in a row, back to back. And I was like, okay, is that good or is that bad? He said, no, man, I, I love it. I love this. This is one of the coolest indie 
film projects I have ever come across. And he he fell in love with it. And uh, and I said, well, I, uh, next thing you know, and I, I give him a number two like a month later, and he just fell in love with that. And he said, dude, I got I want to be on this show. What can I do to be on this show? And you know, we just shooting a bull. And I said, well, what would you want to do? Because I'm sitting there. Here's a new guy. You know, he, you know, he's got some celebrity status, you know, he's wanting to do something, you know, what am I going to do with him? I, I done created my world. I said, so, you know, we got to make him a bad guy. So I'm actually, so I started going through my old notes from my comic book series from, you know, 10 years ago. And, I, and here was this character called Dread Drake. He was an ancient vampire who was kind of in the stories, but he didn't do a whole lot because he was like that, the big bad vampire that stayed in the background. Okay. You know, he was in control of everything, but he didn't get his hands dirty. So I thought, you know, I've done all, I've done like seven trailers, little short videos and stuff, and I never found the right actor to play this part. And I said, dude, and I said, I think you can actually pull this off because this guy, he's actually a, he's a character himself. He loves to get in character. And I said, and that's what I need for this kind of role is someone who knows kind of like a Johnny Depp. When you give Johnny Depp a character the guy becomes the character and and that's how santiago is he whatever role he's playing the guy within a snap of a finger he will transform <laughs> he's not santiago when the, when you're rolling the camera that's cool and just to tell you how uh, it's a lot of you they probably don't understand how important that is but when the on the first night we got the the second night we got the film with him we had designed this big, huge uh, warehouse with this throne room, vampire throne room. We got, gosh, about a hundred candles everywhere, vampire girls everywhere. This industrial nastiness, horror looks like a, a scene out of Saul is what it looks like. Mm. But here's this huge throne that we built. Santiago comes in in full vampire makeup. I don't know if you got a picture of that to show everybody later, but he sits down, and dude, when he begins to speak. The first thing that popped in my head was I remember as a kid watching He-Man when Skeletor would sit on his throne and start ordering everybody around. It sent cold chills down my back. The hair raised up on me. I mean, it was just, that's Dread Drake. And, and I'm telling you what, dude, to create something from 10 years ago to have someone come in and take your project seriously and to put 200% or more and showcase in my work the way this man has done this character it is just it is like a dream come true. I that's mean, it's good. so much satisfaction that's come out of it. Well, we're actually going to be having Santiago soon, so that that's awesome. I'll be able to inquire about that yeah. and his thoughts about it. That's very cool. So um, you have a project on Indiegogo now. Yes. Uh, is this one of these two films or is this another project? Uh, this is to wrap up. Uh, we're actually going back on the, the first one, the Indian Mummy. We're actually doing a brand new director's cut on it. And number two, we just done a new director's cut on it. And, and this finish up three and four. So it's project one through four. This is for all four of them. To wrap, like I said, this this the reason I'm putting so much emphasis on these four because one through four is really telling. I'm wrapping up these story arcs that I created from ten years ago. So, and I really want to put all the efforts into it. We got some locations that we're actually having to throw down some a good chunk of change to be on it because it's just some some things you just can't fake. You you just you got to go on location. And some of them are expensive, and we got some costumes we're still, and we got a big, huge, 15-foot-tall Indian totem pole that we're building. <laughs> and that is not cheap, because uh, we're actually, it's, it's going to look totally authentic. And uh, to get all the materials it takes to, to do it, and it's going to be real, and when we get done with it, I'm probably somewhere down the line going to auction that baby off on eBay <laughs> or something. But but it, like I said, we're, we're going big. I mean, we're doing things... Uh, that a lot of independent film probably people wouldn't even try. Uh, for and I'm like on some of the nights we film, we got thirty some people in front of the camera mm. on a couple of scenes. So I mean, in on most independents that's our size, that's that's a no no. You, you you know you keep it small, but you know I don't believe in small. I believe in go big or go home. I mean that's we're here to tell a story. 
uh, we're here to find great artists and stuff like that. I, I, I ain't going to lie. I'm a slave driver on set. I, I will push you and push you and push you. Whatever you think you can do, I'm going to take you 25% past that. Now, where did you learn, any? Uh, I, I guess for lack of better words, the skills to do a film? Uh, that actually came from uh, Mark Hanna, and plus I learned a lot of it through pro wrestling. Because, see, when I actually done Smoky Mountain Championship Wrestling, I was the oddball guy who used to go hang out with the TV producer because we, we were on TV twice a month. Okay. So we done our TV tapings. I used to go hang out with the producer and the director of the TV show, and that's how I learned how they done their setups, getting ready for interviews. I was very interested on that side of the, the, the fence, even during the wrestling years. So that's when I got into doing a lot of uh, managing, putting on wrestling shows. I done I done promoting for a while, okay. and uh, then like I said, then I just carried that same interest. And when I met uh, Mark Hanna and these other film producers that were hiring us to do the choreography on the stunt fights and stuff, I just they seen that drive to want to know this side of the fence. So there's a lot of it I already kind of knew, as far as the doing the basic directing and stuff like that. So I got into, uh, so they noticed that. And so Mark Hanna just started, hey, you're my right-hand guy. So when we go on set and I'm doing a project, uh, I want you to be right here beside me learning everything I want to do. So I become basically his assistant off and on for the last 10 years. And, and that's the best way to learn. You find someone who's already in the business right now and you get beside them and you watch every little move they make because uh, that's on the job training that's the best way to do it cool okay well um let's uh let the audience know where they can either order your films uh find you right let's uh, see if we can get into that uh you can go to our website at www.sextoncreations.com or you can go to facebook slash sexton creations uh you can order and see all the artwork anything that you want to buy from prints to statues to replicas, one of a kind artworks. Uh, we even have every once in a while some movie props that we sell. That's uh, being a part of this production and stuff like that. So that's that's the two big places that you can uh, find everything that we're doing. And like I said, and I love if you want to email us if you got questions. I'm always I always answer back to the fans. So awesome. Well, they have it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, be sure to check out sextoncreations.com and also check them out on Facebook to follow what's going on. And make sure you look up that Indiegogo and see if you can support this uh, the finalization of these yeah, films. Yeah, Indiegogo Paranormal Chasers. Excellent. And uh, that is the end of our show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Kevin, for uh, coming on to the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, had an awesome time, dude. Anytime you want me to come back, love to be come back, dude. And thank you guys for watching the episode. Uh, as you know, I'm constantly finding great new talents, musicians, filmmakers, artists of all types, and uh, I bring them on so that I can introduce them to you, and hopefully you become a fan. So uh, you can follow me on Facebook at Carlos Phoenix, or you can follow The Lounge at The Lounge Magazine on Facebook, um, and also you can follow me on Twitter, Carlos Phoenix. Thanks, everybody, and have a great night. story about his uh, grandfather received this gift from Nikola Tessa and it was this uh, machine to help him in his quest on his uh, paranormal activity. Listen to me, Jonathan. The machine doesn't talk to the dead. It raises them from the dead. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's good. Okay. Oh, that'll be like this. Oh, 
what do we do now? We're stuck. I am not like this. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Do you feel that? He's dead, man. 